Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Guy Bridgman. I'm the Vice Chair of the University of Alberta Board of Governors. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered today on Treaty 6 territory. The University of Alberta respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nation, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Thank you for coming today. I'd like to recognize some of our special guests for today. From the Government of Alberta, the Honourable Jason Kenney, Premier of Alberta, the Honourable Doug Schweitzer, Minister of Jobs, Economy and Innovation. From the University of Alberta, Bill Flanagan, President and Vice Chancellor of the University. Amina Robinson Fayek, Vice President, Research and Innovation from the University. Lauren Tyrell, Founding Director, Li Kaixing Institute of Virology. Mateus Guta, Professor and Chair from the University. And distinguished guests, John Lewis, CEO Antos Pharmaceuticals, Andrew McIsaacs, CEO Applied Pharmaceutical Innovations, and Brad Stevens, President and CEO Northern RMRNA. Welcome to the Li Kai Shing uh, Center for Health Research Innovation, one of several state-of-the-art facilities that drive forward the University of Alberta's world-leading health research. It's now my pleasure to invite the Honourable Jason Kenney to Premier of Alberta to come to the podium. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bridgman. It's great to be back here at the Li Kaixing Institute of Virology. Thank you, uh, uh, President Flanagan and everybody from the U of A for welcoming Minister Schweitzer and myself here. Uh, particularly great to see Dr. Lauren uh, Terrell and uh, representatives of the, not only the university but also of Entos Pharmaceuticals, uh, Applied Pharmaceutical Innovations and Northern RNA. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Terrell for his role on Canada's COVID-19 task force, uh, the vaccine task force, and I also understand that uh, he recently just won the Hepatitis B Foundation's highest honour for his work in advancing science and developing treatments uh, for Hepatitis B. So Albertans are proud of your achievements, Doctor, and I uh, know that you're an inspiration to the, to the many students uh, at this institution. We've all learned that we need to invest in our health security uh, through the COVID era and beyond it, as much as we do uh, focus on things like national security and food security. The news uh, last week of the Omicron variant of COVID-19 is a reminder uh, that this disease continues to challenge the world. The best thing that we can do as a province in the long run is to make sure that we have as much capacity as possible within our own borders to handle whatever may be thrown at us uh, by this disease or similar uh, diseases in the future. Alberta needs to create that capacity here at home, not just for the research and development of vaccines, something that uh, the Li Kaixing Institute is already a leader at, but also in manufacturing vaccines, ideally here in Canada and it would be wonderful if we were doing that here in the province of Alberta. So I am very excited uh, to make a big announcement today. The Government of Alberta will provide $55 million in funding uh, to the uh, Li Kaixing Institute of Virology here at the University of Alberta. This is on top of the $20 million that we already announced uh, earlier this year in, the, in this space. Today's funding follows a request for proposals uh, from Alberta's Ministry of Jobs, Economy and Innovation that was uh, opened earlier this year, and uh, the successful applicants are with us here today. The funding to the Li Kaixing Institute will include vaccine portfolio development, support for Alberta cell therapy manufacturing, a level three biosafety lab, and a structural biology facility. The funding will address the need for vaccine development here, but will also support the broader pharmaceutical and life sciences sector in Alberta helping to create uh, new jobs and, and opportunities for economic diversification. On top of this exciting news, Alberta's government is also announcing three other recipients of funding from the spring request for proposals. Entos Pharmaceuticals will receive $15.5 million from Alberta to fund clinical trials and establish a commercial manufacturing facility here in Edmonton. Applied Pharmaceutical Innovations will receive $5.6 million to build a new facility for manufacturing ingredients for pharmaceuticals, and Northern RNA will receive $5 million to help expand RNA development in the province. 
While this is contingent on federal funding coming through as well, this $26.1 million uh, in funding to the three approved companies will help prepare our province to meet the health care challenges of the future. The funding con constitutes 10% of project funding, uh, but this is an important uh, way to prime the pump, uh, hopefully to, to attract that additional federal funding. Uh, and we, we uh, will be calling on the federal government to do just that. Uh, they've done so uh, with projects in other provinces, and we certainly expect them to do so here uh, in Alberta. We've been in contact with the Government of Canada on this, and uh, they uh, are receptive, but no final decisions have yet been made. According to global ranking organization Startup Genome, Edmonton is one of the emerging life science ecosystems in the world, uh, alongside cities like Kyoto, Toronto, Miami, and of course Silicon Valley. Alberta already has more than 200 life science companies, and the industry attracted $430 million in private capital investment in, back in 2019, supporting more than 15,000 high-paying jobs. So Alberta's government identified pharmaceutical and life sciences as a key target sector in the economic recovery plan. Today, we are putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to growing this industry and making Alberta a global leader in innovation and the full spectrum of vaccine development. That starts with the research at, at places like the Li Kaixing Institute, where Dr. Terrell and his team are leading the way to facilities like those that these successful applications are hoping to build uh, here in Alberta in the near future. This is a big step, as I say, in the diversification of Alberta's economy. We're all committed to growing this sector, which provides high paying jobs to thousands of Albertans. Our world-class post-secondary institutions will feed into, crit into critical research which uh, companies, both those represented here today uh, and those who will buy into the Alberta Advantage in the future, will be able to use uh, uh, for decades to come to do things like combating viruses such as COVID-19 while pioneering cutting-edge treatment for hepatitis, diabetes, cancer, and other diseases. And with these great minds uh, harnessing all that Alberta has to offer, the sky, I really believe, is the limit. So thank you, and uh, delighted to be here for today's exciting announcement. And I will now turn it over uh, to Bill Flanagan, President of the University of Alberta. Premier and Minister Schweitzer, uh, thank you, and thank you to the Government of Alberta for this transformational $55 million investment in one of the most important areas of research at the University of Alberta today. I want to congratulate Dr. Lauren Tyrell and Dr. Matthias Goethe for their leadership in attracting one of the largest research grants ever received by the University of Alberta. For more than a century, the University of Alberta and the province have been partners in building and transforming Alberta's key industries, industries like agriculture and engineering. Biomanufacturing is the next frontier, and the timing could not be better. In the past 50 years, Canada has become increasingly dependent on other countries for its pharmaceuticals. We once imported just 19% of our vaccines and therapeutics. Today, we import more than four times that amount. And COVID-19 has shown us that global supply chains are more fragile than ever. So I applaud the government of Alberta for its vision to create and expand biomanufacturing capacity right here in the province. And we are ready. Today's investments build on decades of world leading research on vaccines and therapeutics at the University of Alberta. When the pandemic hit, U of A researchers pivoted immediately publishing more than 120 studies in the first year and securing over 30 million in federal COVID-19 research funding. And today's new investment will allow us to accelerate this work even further, not only for COVID-19, but for other diseases. And with it, we can build and enhance key infrastructure that supports drug development from, dis from product development right here in Alberta. Our sciences will be able to identify emerging viruses with unprecedented speed and precision, test new treatments in state-of-the-art facilities, and run clinical trials to bring medicines to all Albertans and indeed around the world. While the health benefits of such discovery and development will extend well beyond our borders, the potential economic benefits for Alberta are remarkable. By 2023, worldwide revenues in the pharmaceutical and therapeutic sector 
are expected to reach over $1.5 trillion. One successful vaccine can generate royalties in excess of $300 million over its lifetime and employ hundreds of people. So today's other recipients, Entos Pharmaceuticals, Applied Pharmaceutical Innovations, and Northern RNA, exemplify what is possible when we work together, and strong partnerships will be critical to the future success of biomanufacturing in Alberta. And as this investment spurs more drug research and development, other spin-offs and start-offs will emerge. Together, we will attract and retain the world's best scientific talent, building a strong and vibrant uh, pharmaceutical and life sciences industry right here in Alberta. So once again, thank you to the Government of Alberta for this historic investment and for being a key partner in innovation. And I would now like to invite to the podium Dr. Matthias Goethe, Chair of the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Alberta and principal applicant in this funding. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Flanagan, uh, Premier Kenny, uh, Minister Schweitzer. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning for this historical announcement. On behalf of a large group of scientists uh, here at the University of Alberta, we would like to thank you for selecting our proposal uh, for funding. This grant will make a difference. It will make a difference in our efforts to develop and manufacture effective vaccines and therapeutics for emerging viruses. We all know COVID-19 is not the first pandemic and it won't be the last. Over the past two decades, we have witnessed outbreaks of SARS, flu, Zika, and many other viruses. For the most part, we were caught off guard with no effective medical countermeasures. Here at the University of Alberta, we feel that we, we have to assume a leadership role in this, in this field and in this regard. With a strong track record of, of excellence in the study of chronic viral infections, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and herpes viruses, and so forth, we recently broadened our focus to work also on emerging viruses, including, of course, SARS-CoV-2 and its variants. With this new grant, the University of Alberta is in an excellent position to develop a strong biomanufacturing pipeline from discovery research to translation and clinical validation. Discovery research is the foundation that needs to be supported in a sustainable manner to produce new knowledge. The COVID-19 vaccines have been developed in less than a year, which is really stunning and quite remarkable. They have been developed because critical basic knowledge was generated years before the pandemic. Infrastructure, including state-of-the-art equipment for discovery research, biosafety laboratories, and in-house manufacturing, is required to advance our discoveries into clinical trials. Specifically, a cutting-edge cryo-electron microscopy platform will guide novel strategies to target viruses with vaccines and therapeutics. Upgrades for our biosafety laboratory will facilitate the validation of new medical countermeasures and biologically relevant model systems. And finally, important additions to the Alberta Cell Therapy Manufacturing Facility will enable in-house fill finish manufacturing of vaccines for clinical use. These capabilities will also significantly enhance the training of highly qualified personnel to support bioinnovation and biomanufacturing in Alberta. So once again, thank you for this generous funding um, and for investing in this important uh, work. And uh, with that, I would uh, now like uh, to invite to the podium Dr. Lauren Terrell, who is my co-principal applicant on this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Premier Kenny, Minister Schweitzer, 
Board of Governors Vice Chair, Dr. Brig Brigman, Brigman uh, President Flanagan, Vice President Robin Fadip, and Deans Hemelgard and Cummins. This is a very special day for the University of Alberta, and we are very grateful. The government's decision to fund our proposal on vaccine and therapeutic countermeasures for COVID-19 and future pandemics is very timely for the University of Alberta and our community of virologists, bacteriologists, immunologists, and structural biologists who are tackling some of the most serious and debilitating diseases of our time. COVID-19 is a major pandemic affecting the world, much like the major flu epidemic of 1918-1919. As an infectious disease specialist, I have witnessed at least one or two new diseases every year since I began practicing. Many of these have had major impact on healthcare systems and patients, including diseases like HIV AIDS, 1983, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, Zika, Ebola, SARS, and COVID-19. These diseases also have devastating effects on our society. These include the disruption of normal activities and huge financial and social costs to individuals, families, businesses, and governments. Future pandemics are inevitable. We need to be prepared to control them as quickly as possible. The need for the current pandemic to be controlled has given birth to some remarkable science, particularly the new vaccines, the technologies that led to the mRNA vaccines. In addition, the development of novel antiviral drugs for COVID-19 and other specific diseases will have a huge impact on these diseases and will save lives. I use the example of two diseases that we have not been able to get a vaccine for, HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C, yet new drugs have changed those diseases completely. Scientists at the University of Alberta have made significant contributions to this battle against emerging infectious diseases. No better example than Michael Houghton, last year's Nobel laureate, uh, for his discovery of hepatitis C virus. The university has been building its infrastructure and expertise in virology and immunology over the years, and this positioned us very well to respond to the government of Alberta's call to grow Alberta's vaccine and therapeutic capacity. This grant and its potential outcomes are well aligned with the strategic plan of the government of Alberta to diversify the economy, the strategic plans of the University of Alberta and the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry to increase translation and commercialization of discovery research. Mr. Premier, and Minister, we are very grateful for the tremendous support from the government of Alberta and the people of this great province. With your help, we will continue to play a significant role in the control of current and future pandemics and improve the health of Albertans, Canadians, and people worldwide. This is our goal. On behalf of the entire team, Matthias and I say thank you, thank you. I'm going to go slightly off script for a second. I want to thank Carla. Without her help, this grant would not have made it in the short timelines that we saw, so thank you. I would now like to invite Dr. Amina robinson Fayek, University of Alberta Vice President, of research and innovation to come to the podium.
Dr. Terrell, Dr. Guta, thank you for your leadership on this initiative and congratulations on the major milestone it's reaching today. Premier Kenny, Minister Schweitzer, I want to thank you and the Government of Alberta for this critical investment and vote of confidence in U of A research. One of the reasons why this initiative is so exciting as the National Biomanufacturing Life Strategy moves forward is that the U of A and Alberta are truly positioned to be leaders in the country. Thanks in part to investments like this one, the U of A has developed excellence in vaccine and drug development over many years. We've been able to attract and cultivate world-class talent to build crucial research and infrastructure, including hubs, such as our venue today, the Li Keqing Center for Health Research Innovation, and to translate research and discovery into life-changing innovations. But as any researcher knows, Getting the research from the lab out into the world can be a long and complex process. That's where today's funding can make a vital difference. This initiative will help to create an innovative supply chain to produce vaccines and therapeutics right here in this province. It will help U of A researchers to move their discoveries from the lab to clinical trials and ultimately to market. In short, this funding will help transform U of A's renowned discovery research into the next generation of vaccines and therapeutics. Over the next seven years, the National Biomanufacturing and Life Sciences Strategy will invest more than $2.2 billion in this area. Today, we are poised to be leaders in that strategy and to attract additional investments to build Alberta's biomanufacturing capacity. This is a significant opportunity in this province and we are well positioned to pursue it. I want to join President Flanagan and Drs. Guta and Terrell in thanking the Government of Alberta for this timely investment in research and innovation at the University of Alberta. I would now like to invite Dr. John Lewis, CEO of Entos Pharmaceuticals and a U of A researcher to the podium. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Robinson Fayek and, uh, and uh, Premier Kenny, uh, Minister Schweitzer, my friends and colleagues at the University of Alberta. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. John Lewis. I'm the CEO and co founder of Entos Pharmaceuticals. Uh, our technology, uh, Fusigenics, uh, is a platform for building innovative genetic medicines, including vaccines. During the past year, we've been using Fusigenics to develop our own COVID 19 vaccine which is now entering phase two clinical trials. We're also working with partners around the world to develop new treatments for cancer, heart disease, genetic diseases, and more. In fact, uh, we recently announced our latest agreement with Biomarin to develop cures for rare genetic diseases. As those of us in the life sciences know, it's one thing to discover and develop uh, an innovative therapy, but it's another thing entirely to manufacture it at scale necessary both for late stage clinical trials and ultimately for treatments that you or I or any one of our family can take. So that's why Entos uh, is so grateful uh, for this annou announcement for the Alberta government's support for, of our planned commercial manufacturing facility. The committed funding when paired with federal and private support will enable us to create a world-class facility that can produce not only COVID vaccines, but also future genetic medicines, like those developed with Biomarin, right here in Edmonton. Entos and the other companies here today are committed to homegrown innovation, to create transformative vaccines and medicines here in Alberta. But the challenges we're tackling don't just impact the citizens of this province, they impact our society as a whole. I'm optimistic, uh, like our provisional government, that the federal government will similarly prioritize biomanufacturing here in Alberta, and I'd hope that the federal government would deploy resources here in Alberta as they have in Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and the Atlantic provinces. As we're currently seeing with the emergence of the Omicron variant, 
The pandemic is dynamic and fast moving. And the life science industry has no choice but to keep up. We need long-term solutions to secure our own domestic supply of vaccines and therapies for the benefit of Albertans, Canadians, and society at large. So let me again express my deepest thanks uh, to the Premier, the Ministers, and my friends at the University today for their support and their collaboration. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew McIsaac, the CEO of Applied Pharmaceutical in Innovation. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of Applied Pharmaceutical Innovation, uh, our board, our staff, our network, I want to say thank you very much to you, uh, Premier Kenny, uh, Minister Schweitzer, uh, for this announcement today. Uh, there's tremendous potential for Alberta in the life sciences, and the investment announced will pay dividends many times over. As the world continues to find its way through the pandemic, Alberta has a key role to play in building a brighter future through this critical sector. The unique capabilities we hold from world experts who have made discoveries at the cutting edge of medical science to a strong industrial base with talented and hardworking folks who are experienced in building and running facilities that provide the world with it, the critical products it needs. We have tradespeople, technicians, chemists, engineers, biologists, virologists, and many more who are making their careers in the life sciences sector in our province. And there are many, many more waiting to join them. The funding we receive from the province will support the growth of the Canadian Critical Drug Initiative, a cluster of excellence that will not only ensure we are equipped better to address the global challenges of pandemics, uh, but also to rapidly catalyze our strengths in pharmaceutical production and ensure the discoveries of brilliant scientists, including many here today and on campus, uh, reach the patients that desperately need them. This investment builds on um, Albertan ingenuity. We are home to a broad section of companies committed to combating the pandemic, some pivoting to address new challenges, others leveraging decades of expertise. Early in the pandemic, Alberta was the lone supplier around the world of the active ingredient in Remdesivir, the first approved treatment for COVID-19. With your support, we'll be able to play an expanded and critical role in Canada and around the world, working together to ensure we have the medicines we need when we need them for now and in the future. Thank you once again, Premier Kenny and Minister Schweitzer for this investment. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Brad Stevens. I'm the co-founder and president and CEO of Northern RNA, located in uh, Calgary, Alberta. And on behalf of the uh, world-class team at Northern RNA, I'm pleased to be able to re represent them and to thank you, uh, Premier Kenny and Minister Schweitzer, for your investment uh, decision. And we are pleased to be um, as part of this uh, wonderful group, and uh, we are pleased to have been chosen as one of the companies to receive uh, the investment uh, to date. We also add our voice at Northern RNA of congratulations to Dr. Terrell for his uh, recent acknowledgements as a uh, key part of the industry here in Alberta. And we are appreciative, appreciative of all that uh, you have done and for the help and assistance that you've given us as well. And many of you are probably not familiar with Northern RNA. We are a young uh, company, not a year in existence uh, yet. Uh, we focus on the manufacturing of raw materials, essential raw materials that go into the manufacturing of messenger RNA. And so our customers already are uh, local and uh, far and wide. And we are involved, as I said, in the manufacturing of products now currently involved in uh, addressing the COVID uh, challenges that we currently face. But many of our customers are also looking at the maladies uh, that confront society post-COVID. And we are excited to be engaged in part of, uh, with that with them as part of, their, of a part of their research as well. We have a strong team at Northern RNA. We have a diverse 
uh, work group and we have grown and continue to grow incredibly and it's through investments like these that we are will able we will be able to continue to grow and increase the footprint the manufacturing footprint that we think is absolutely critical for this great province now and into the future this is as much about the future it is as it is about the investment in infrastructure uh, here today and uh, as i said we are pleased to be uh, part of it the announcement uh, today on behalf of Northern RNA is really a um, beginning for us to be able, we have uh, looked through the value chain and uh, seen where there are bottlenecks and uh, we are going to try and um, alleviate one of those bottlenecks and that is through the manufacturing of uh, lipids. That will uh, uh, allow us to uh, reduce some of that bottleneck, again, not just during COVID, uh, but into the future. That is one of the challenges that we face in the world today, and it's another opportunity for Alberta, Calgary, uh, for us to be leaders uh, in this now and in the future. And we couldn't be more proud to be part uh, of this ecosystem and look forward to growing along with our distinguished colleagues who've spoken today. The government, again, we express appreciation to our colleagues uh, in all of our universities uh, throughout Alberta. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. That concludes the uh, formal remarks of today's announcement. We're now going to move over to a media Q&A. Uh, for any of our journalists gathered in the room today, we just have a podium uh, mic off to the side of the camera here, and we're going to start in the room before we hop over to the phones. Hello, I'm Audrey Never from French CBC. My first question will be for Premier Kenny. Um, you said several times that it's important to have uh, vaccines manufactured here, but can you explain concretely why it is and give us examples of if we don't do that, what could happen? If you could say that in French and English, please. Oh, in French and English? Please. Thank you for the question. So, as you recall, Canada was facing significant limits on COVID-19 vaccines for the first few months of this year because we didn't have our own manufacturing capacity and we were experiencing vaccine uh, nationalism uh, in uh, the United States, the European Union and, and elsewhere where those jurisdictions uh, assur assured themselves first access to, to uh, va available vaccines early on. So we were um, not the first in the queue and that frankly cost lives. The fact that uh, we were three to five months behind uh, the United States uh, means that there were many uh, Canadians who otherwise could have prevented severe outcomes uh, had they been vaccinated that weren't. So this can have very real life and death consequences. Uh, and so we need to learn from that experience. Uh, moreover, I think one with the gl global constraints on supply chains uh, right across the world and, and, and every sector of the economy, uh, I think there's a, a, a renewed appreciation of the need for us to onshore production of, uh, of essential uh, products, and that would include uh, pharmaceuticals, it would include vaccines. So, I, I, you know, after the Second World War, the world realized that food security was critically important. And I think uh, when we emerge from the COVID period, there will be a heightened awareness of the need for, uh, for biosecurity with respect to uh, pharmaceuticals and vaccines. En français, uh, je dirais que uh, au début de la pandémie, on a vu uh, une uh, limite grave uh, de uh, uh, de vaccins au Canada par, à cause de nationalisme des vaccins. Uh, L'Union européenne, les États-Unis, uh, effectivement, ont limité les exportations des, uh, des vaccins uh, pour profiter leur, pop, leur population. Alors, uh, on a, ça, ça a duré plusieurs mois que millions de Canadiens n'avaient pas la protection des vaccins à cause de, de ces, ces limites-là. Alors, euh, et d'autant plus euh, avec les, euh, les problèmes euh, des, euh, euh, des, 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 de, dans l'économie globale actuellement, ça souligne l'importance de production des biens essentiels dans notre propre économie. Et je crois que ça, c'est euh, une question de sécurité nationale et économique. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question is for the four recipients. I know that some of your, the funding is contingent on um, federal or private funding, but how quickly do you expect the projects for which you would be funded to be up and running?
Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. Um, first of all, I, th I don't think that, um, as a correction, that um, the University of Alberta portion is contingent on federal funding. Um, to answer the second part of your question, the projects are ongoing. So we are basically already working for um, almost two years on approaches for vaccine development, vaccine uh, uh, discovery of therapeutics, um, and these projects are ongoing and hopefully we will uh, be able to, to deliver um, results very soon to, to also leverage the funding and to, to raise more funds at the federal level and eventually also um, from other institutions, uh, other funding organizations abroad, like for instance the NIH. Certainly um, this grant will put us in a, in a very good position like that. Thank you. Okay, I just want to do a last call for questions from the floor before I move over to the phones. Oh, pardon me. I jumped. I jumped to it, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. In the in the uh, situation for Northern RNA, we do await a final investment decision from the federal government. We're going to work with them as soon as possible. But from approval, um, we 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 won't be doing uh, a greenfield. We'll be doing a brownfield with uh, real estate that exists now. So we would anticipate uh, around the 18 month mark would be when we would be up and running. Okay. Now I'll do a last call for questions from the floor before we move over to the phones. Good morning or uh, afternoon, are we there yet? Um, Amanda with CTV. I'm not sure who this question or who wants to answer this question, but I, I want to know a little bit more about the bio lab and the, um, uh, the other facilities. So are these new facilities or are we enhancing, you know, facilities that we already have here? Um, so I don't know who wants to take that one. Yeah, I'm happy to take that question as well. Um, so it's a little bit of everything. So we do have here uh, at the University of Alberta a biosafety level three lab that needs to be upgraded. The fact that we have that um, biosafety lab here allowed us really to start immediately um, two years ago to work on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. So obviously right now, um, we need to increase the capacity and this grant allows us to do that, exactly. The um, ACTM, the Alberta Cell Therapy Manufacturing Facility, is also a facility that is up and running for, for many years. Um, it is um, directed by Dr. Greg uh, Corbett, uh, who is part on this uh, grant application, and it will be upgraded um, as well. Um, what is completely new is the uh, structural biology platform um, referred to as cryo-electron microscopy. So this is basically um, a very a fancy microscope, a high-resolution microscope that allows us to zoom in into the virus and to look at specific structures um, that we can target with vaccines or with therapeutics. This is cutting edge technology, it is vital, it is extremely important that we have this technology here in Alberta. The entire structural biology worldwide will move into this direction. There are just three facilities here in Canada so far, and uh, we are grateful that we have an opportunity to build this very important uh, uh, state-of-the-art infrastructure here as well. Thank you. Okay, did you have a follow-up at all? I do have a follow-up. It is for uh, the Premier. Um, I, and it's off topic, my apologies. Um, the Health Minister alluded yesterday um, uh, that Ivan Bernardo was paid for doing co consultancy work, um, but wouldn't comment on the nature of the payment. Ivan Bernardo tells us that the $28,000 was unpaid expenses from his time in government. So I guess, First of all, was the minister confused in, in what he said, and how does one rack up $28,000 in expenses? My, my understanding that was over two years of travel expenses uh, around the province, so, and it was all approved by the uh, public service according to 
the uh, normal guidelines. Um, and so he hadn't submitted expenses for two years of work, and that was a two-year period. Um, and I would just note that uh, expenses for staff and ministerial offices are down substantially under this government. By about, they're down by about 25 percent overall. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we'll go over to the phones. Uh, we have time for about four callers today. Operator, can you please put through our first call? David Staples, Edmonton Journal. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine in the, out of the UK and Sweden was developed, I'm reading, uh, based on 20 years of funding in the hundreds of millions of pounds, mainly from government sources. And that put them in the game to develop this vaccine when COVID came up. Is this amount of funding enough to put um, Alberta researchers in the game the next time a major new disease comes up and there's a huge demand for a vaccine. Do you think that this is enough funding? And is that the goal here, to be to be ready for that? Thanks for the question. Um, so I think it's important to note uh, that this funding sends a very, very critical message uh, to federal partners that uh, Alberta really sees its role within the supply chain. Uh, a lot of the investments in vaccine production uh, around the world have come from a federal level, uh, working in conjunction with the regional areas. So I think that um, this is a great first step, and it will, as I said in my remarks, will lead to tremendous benefits to, uh, to the province. Um, but again, it's the first step in, uh, in a road to, to really boosting the life sciences economy in the province. Thanks, Andrew. David, did you have a follow-up today? Yes, for the Premier, and this is off topic, uh, off this topic. Um, right now, the federal government is looking at re redistributing seats at the federal level with Alberta getting three more. But there's a uh, huge fuss in Quebec because um, they're going to drop a seat. And there's talk about kind of putting Quebec's current level of seats, you know, forever into uh, uh, so it can never be changed. I'm just wondering what the Premier thinks. Uh, is Alberta getting enough representation? Will still be underrepresented based on population? And is he worried about rep by pop being further eroded in Canada if Quebec gets what it's seeking here? Uh, the answers, David, are no. And yes, no, we don't have adequate representation. And yes, I am concerned about the inequities in the Federation be, uh, becoming more deeply enshrined. Uh, as you know, uh, Alberta has uh, more people than all four Atlantic Canadian provinces, and yet they have more seats. We have twice as many people, I should say, as the four Atlantic Canadian provinces, and they have more seats in the House of Commons. Uh, of course, far more seats in the Senate as well. Um, I understand that, that some of these things are vestiges of the Confederation era when the, West, uh, when the Western provinces did not exist. Uh, but... Uh, other federations, uh, Australia, uh, the United States, have managed to change with time to recognize uh, population. And a, a, a key foundational principle of liberal democracy is representation by population. And we don't have that in Canada. And this growing inequity, I think, it, it will continue to put real strains on the federation. Uh, so uh, th this does concern me. The, uh, Harper government added four seats uh, for Alberta and British Columbia um, approximately, uh, well, several years ago, uh, and we clearly need significantly more seats. I, I would love it for if, if one day we could get the leaders of the Federation together to agree uh, that we need uh, something much closer to representation by uh, population, but at the very least, we shouldn't aggravate the current inequities in the distribution of seats in the House of Commons. Thanks, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our second caller of the day? Kelly Kreiderman, Globe and Mail. Hi there. This question is for the Premier. I'm sure you've heard that Quebec will be sending checks to low- and middle-income uh, residents to help them deal with inflationary pressures. Do you have any plans, or does your government is your government working on any, on any plans for how the province can manage this period of high inflation? Uh, yes, we are very concerned about the uh, rising cost of living uh, and high inflation. Uh, first of all, we would uh, call on the federal government to uh, adopt responsible monetary and fiscal policies that do not f uh, further uh, 
that don't, that don't add fuel to the fire of these inflationary pressures that uh, are making life more difficult for everyone. Uh, we are looking at uh, what measures we might be able to take um, before or in the uh, budget, uh, February budget for 2022. Um, and uh, I would just say stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're not, uh, we haven't yet, yet made any decisions, but we're very, we, we share in that concern about uh, just the cost of, of living. Uh, groceries continue to go up, home heating, uh, gasoline, consumer products right across the economy. And uh, uh, if there's some positive offsetting news, it's that last year we saw about a 6% increase in incomes in Alberta. Um, and as the economy uh, picks up momentum, uh, I expect to see wage inflation uh, to help at least some families cope with the higher cost of living. And Kelly, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, just to follow on David Staples' question, have you made any formal submission about rep by pop to the federal government, or do you plan to? Uh, we plan to. We, we were not consulted uh, about the formula that they've proposed. Uh, I'm hoping to be in Ottawa for meetings uh, with Prime Minister and senior ministers in a couple of weeks, and we, we'll certainly be raising it then and there. Thanks, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next call? Julia Wong, CBC. Hi, this question is for the Premier. Yesterday, Dr. Henshaw said now would not be the time to relax rules around indoor gatherings. Now, the day prior, you had said a modest relaxation of those rules could be considered for the holidays. So do you still stand by that? We, we're completely aligned. I was in several hours of briefings and cabinet committee discussions with the chief medical officer yesterday. Uh, we have been uh, considering uh, the way forward. Uh, if the uh, numbers continue to go in a positive direction uh, with declining pressure on the health care system, uh, we ha have been considering possible uh, mod modifications, but for the time being, we'll be maintaining the current policy. Uh, particularly with the emergence of the Omicron variant, we want to be uh, get, give um, uh, get some time to uh, observe uh, whether this may pose a, a additional threat uh, to uh, the healthcare system in terms of severe outcomes. Uh, it's too early to know that now, so we'll be maintaining our current policy setting for the time being. And Julie, do you have a follow-up today? Yes, I do. Thank you. Just to um, continue on that thread, you had expressed concern over compliance if rules were not relaxed for the holiday. So if they are not, what are the province's plans for enforcement? Well, at the end of the day, this is a free society, and we're not going to put a cop on every street corner to check people's papers as they're uh, going into homes for uh, Christmas uh, to socialize with people. We we ask Albertans to, to do the right thing, to follow the guidelines, and, and clearly the a majority of people have been doing that, which has helped us to get uh, uh, the uh, COVID numbers down and uh, relieve some of the uh, very severe pressure that was on our hospitals two months ago. So we just encourage Albertans uh, we know, we, to, to continue to be patient. I know everybody is completely uh, fed up with this and, and uh, discouraged with the uh, new variant, um, but uh, we just have to continue to pull together uh, to avoid uh, returning to a situation of unacceptable pressure on our hospitals. Uh, so again, um, as you know, uh, AHS bylaw officers are responsible for enforcing public health orders as our uh, designated um, uh, law enforcement agencies, and there has been enforcement of cases of uh, businesses, for example, that have flagrantly violated, for example, the restriction exemption program. Uh, but uh, we're, we're not going to turn into a police state uh, checking people's papers as they as they go and visit friends and family. We're just we're, we're, we ask people to to, um, uh, uh, to to cooperate with the measures that are in place. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our last call of the day? Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is for the Premier. Um, one of my favorite topics. Um, two years ago. The then Justice Minister in your government talked about photo radar and said the stats coming in don't indicate a public safety return. Your transportation minister said photo radar in Alberta made only a, quote, marginal contribution to safety while the province had the most photo radar devices per person in the country. For two years, your government went out and talked to local governments who, surprise, surprise, love photo radar and love the money they get, and went and talked to the police who, again, also love the photo radar money, and came back today 
without any further evidence, without any further studies, and, come, and came out and said, basically, photo radar is really neat. We're going to change the rules a little bit, and maybe, and photo radar is here to stay. So what the heck has happened? Why, why, why do we still have photo radar? Well, Rick, we have made changes to uh, combat abuse of photo radar, the so-called speed traps uh, that sometimes municipalities have established not for uh, traffic safety, but for revenue generation. We've made it very clear in these revised uh, guidelines, uh, which will be enforced, that uh, if, if municipalities are uh, misusing the power of uh, photo radar uh, to basically uh, generate revenue as opposed to focus on, on uh, if they, uh, traffic safety, that we won't permit that. Um, at the end of the day, this is a municipal power that they have, and they're accountable to their uh, local residents. Uh, there have been municipalities, Drayton Valley comes to mind, that they had a referendum on this, and they voted to remove photo radar. If there are other communities across the province that, that feel similarly, they can have plebiscites, they can bring motions to their town and city councils, uh, and uh, so uh, our government respects the authority that, that local governments have and the accountability that they have to their local voters. So that's where, the, that's where this belongs. But one thing we clearly will not uh, tolerate is, uh, is abusing the authority to do the, uh, photo radar locations uh, uh, primarily for revenue collection. Henrik, do you have a follow-up to end things up today? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my follow-up, uh, Premier, I've done a lot of, lot of stuff on the uh, stories on, on photo radar. The reason there are these fishing holes, these speed traps, are because that's exactly where the revenue is generated. And uh, because they happen to be areas where they're not necessarily areas of, of high accidents. So that hasn't happened. Now, you're assuring us today it will happen. But I guess the question I have, and maybe I'm sounding a bit like former Premier Mike Harris in 1995, but why not, as a province, just say there, is, there will be no photo radar when, again, independent of what any city or municipality wants to do, your own cabinet ministers indicated through research that was done, and quite frankly, the previous government, both have said that there is a very, very marginal um, contribution to safety. So why not just get rid of it? Again, this is something that uh, municipalities can, can do, Rick. We respect that. And if local voters uh, uh, don't think that this is making a contribution to public safety and traffic safety, then uh, they can petition their local councils uh, to reverse the local policies. And uh, that's happened in, in various communities around the province. So uh, the power is, is with the people. If they want a change in policy, they can get it at their local government. All right. Thanks, folks. That concludes today's media.